And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome to Open Connection. I'm your host, Robert Picto. Our show today comes to you from the traditional and unceded territory of the Simshan people. We don't see things as they are. We see things as we are because we see things through our lens of our own hopes, fears, and biases. Reality is the state of things as they actually exist, whereas perception is a particular way of looking at or understanding the state of things. We begin today's Open Connection highlighting MLA Ellis Ross' talk at Nation to Nation. For those of you who don't know me, I got elected to council in 2003 for Housing Nation. I was a councillor for eight years. I then got elected for chief councillor for six years, at which point I resigned as chief councillor to run for MLA, mainly to uh, see if I can get LNG going in BC, specifically in Kitimat, because we had LNG Canada as well as Chevron going at the same time. Listening to your, your, your conversation here over the years, and I've been to many, many conferences like this all over Canada, and I hear your frustration. In fact, the conversation you're having right now is the same conversation we had 15 years ago when I was going to conferences. Everything you're doing is right. You're doing it for the right reasons. But if you're anything like me, you're going through learning curves. And that learning curve is basically understanding the difference between perception and reality. This is a cold, hard awakening for me, starting in 2003, when I thought I'd let my name stand for council because I could access council's billions of dollars so I could support my basketball teams, only to find out my council is one of the poorest bands in BC. They had no money. In fact, we were in such a bad deficit, the Canadian government was threatening to come in and shut us down, send council home, and they were going to start paying off our bills. Consider this. Heisen Nation is seven miles away from the district of Kitimat. At one time, they're the wealthiest in Canada in terms of per capita wages. Seven miles down the road, one of the poorest communities, my band, Kitimat Village. Why? Perception. Because back in those days, there was no tools for First Nations to utilize. We had Section 35 of the Constitution which was actually implemented in 1982. That should have been the silver bullet. That's the perception. In reality, Section 35 of the Constitution only recognized rights and title. It didn't implement it. So Section 35, standing by itself as a solution, was only perception. Then think about all the case law that was determined in the courts of Canada, B.C. over the last 40 years, since 1982. And I'm talking Miccosu Cree, Gladstone, the Haida court case. I'm talking about all those court cases. Those were the tools that were actually laid in front of us to achieve our dreams. It should have been a no-brainer. We should have achieved success as First Nations based on the case law. Well, that's perception. The reality is you need leadership to take the principles of these case laws and leverage it against the crown. If you don't do that, the crown is not going to come banging down your door saying, I want to consult and accommodate you. I want to lift your people out of poverty. That is not the way it works. There is a reality and perception when it comes to leadership versus politics and if you want a living example of what that means come to Kitimat Village where we are now one of the wealthiest communities in BC we are one of the most progressive how many of you ever heard of a First Nation buying property and paying taxes to the municipal government the provincial government and federal government even though it's our land that is a reality of what it means to be successful, of what it means to be independent. 
If you're not willing to step out of your side of your comfort zone, if you're not willing to look in the mirror, you are not going to get the benefit of the change you're looking for. You're not going to get it. Not with those old age mentalities that somehow government has the answer for you. Governments are going to come to your rescue. If that was true, it would have happened decades ago. This comes down to the First Nation knowing exactly what you want. And I tell you what, if you do this, if you make the exercise in determining exactly what you want, it's going to be a painful look in the mirror. Because you're going to have to look at the old, your own mistakes in terms of your narrative, in terms of your mentality, that's actually keeping you from the future that you want. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Thank you for staying with us. Physics tells us that momentum is a... Thank you for staying with us. Physics is... Thank you for staying with us. Physics tells us that momentum is a product of mass versus velocity of an object. But before we can develop momentum, we need to apply work to get things off the ground from a resting position. Let us return the conversation as Ellis shares the next hardest step. The next hardest thing to do is to go after that dream. Once you determine what you want, if it's independence you want, you want to get away from the internet, that's going to be hard to realize. But then when you go to the how, that's going to be even worse. People are going to hate you. Your own people are going to call you sellouts, apples. The NGOs are going to come after you and they're going to brand you. They're going to brand you as a climate change denier. They're going to brand you. And you know what? It's never going to stop. I'm in MLA now for five years. I still get attacked from all sides. The only people that don't attack me are Heisler band members, 1900 strong. But it took a lot for me to convince them that we had to change our ways and our mentality if we wanted a better future for our kids and our grandchildren. It was hard. It took me two years as chief counselor to convince my council, my people, we had to change. It was hard. But now our people are living the benefits of that life. They're getting houses, mortgages in their own right through the banks on reserve that the council allowed. They're going on vacation. They're understanding there's a bigger world out there full of opportunity. They're becoming lawyers and business people. This has got nothing to do with your race. It's got nothing to do with being native or non-native. It's got to do with a person getting off welfare and getting away from the violence of poverty whether you're native or non-native, that's what it means. So listening to this conversation over the number of years and my own learning curve where I realized I'm part of the problem. Me, with my anti-resource development mentality I had before I got in council and not understanding the facts of how a country works in terms of revenues for the hospitals, the schools, the roads, everything that we take for granted, where does that come from? That comes from a strong economy. If you wipe out your economy, you're going to be dependent on government. And I can tell you, every single First Nation leader in here will tell you, it's horrible being dependent on government. That's what the Indian Act is all about. If you become dependent on government, government controls every facet of your life. Here in Canada, with all the freedoms that we have, with all the opportunity, with all the benefits, you don't want to go down that road. You need to promote a strong economy. But you got to stand up to those that want to wipe it out. So you're starting behind the eight ball as First Nation leaders wanting to develop your own economy. You're starting behind the eight ball because the narrative right now in Canada is that we don't need an economy. We don't need energy. We don't need logging. We don't need mining. You're in a tough spot. But I was there. The one thing that I'll tell you that I learned over the last five years that's missing from your council meetings, 
that's missing from your community meetings, that's missing from these types of conferences, is politics. That's what's missing. Five years in MLA now in the BC Legislature, I am shocked at how much politics and ideology drive what's happening in BC and Canada. If I had known about politics 10 years ago, I could have accomplished what we did in Kinemat in half the time. You've got to understand politics. You've got to understand ideologies. So when you're looking at the government that doesn't support you for your energy project, for your forestry project, for your manufacturing project, you got to understand the party that's elected to power. What is their ideology? Do they support the private sector? Do they support the economy? Because if the party does not support the private sector, they will translate that into government policies. They will transfer that into legislation. The laws that govern this province are driven by politics. This is what's happening in First Nation community. This is why you don't get your projects off the ground. This is why you don't get government support. They'll tell you to your face, oh, this is a great project. We support reconciliation. Oh, we love it. And three years down the line, you're still at that table asking, when can we get approval for our projects? Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome back to Open Connection. According to the Prime Minister of Canada's website, mandate letters outline objectives that each minister will work to accomplish, as well as pressing challenges they will address in their role. Let us return to the conversation as Ella shares more about government mandates. Because it's politics. You will not see this written in any school books. You will not see it in any government literature. But you've got to understand the difference between the political parties in Canada. Whoever's in power got there through an ideology. They got there through a platform. They got through there through a mandate. And they're going to stick to that mandate. And it's going to come out. No matter what they tell you about UNDRIP, for example. No matter what they tell you about reconciliation. What matters is the legislation comes out of BC in Victoria or in Ottawa. You've got to trace that back to the ideology of the party that's in power. Your government supposedly is supposed to be non-political, but they belong to a major party. There's something like what? Four major parties in Canada right now. Four. There's two major powers in BC. If you really want to get past the talking stage, you've got to understand politics. And you got to be aware of it. You got to become involved with it. And you got to utilize that for your own benefit in terms of what you're trying to achieve. If you don't, you're going to be here in the same conference 10 years from now talking about the frustration that I hear right now. I tell you what, never has there been a time in Canadian history where Canadians, whether they know it, not, know it or not, need you as First Nation leaders and your non-Native partners, they need you now more than ever. Canadians don't know this. You probably don't know this. The world is in a horrible position. Globally. We're in a bad spot. We're talking about inflation. We're talking about energy deficiencies. We're talking about wars in Europe. We're talking about Germany possibly freezing over this winter. We always knew there was an energy crisis in China, India, Korea, Japan. We always knew that. That crisis is still there. That's why they're burning so much coal. But did we ever consider that a first world country like Germany would be traveling around the world begging for energy? And they don't care what kind of energy it is. Germany is opening up coal plants again. They want LNG. They want anything they get their hands on. They're talking about nuclear. And if you're trying to achieve climate action goals, 
and you're actually opening up your coal plants again, just like China's been doing for the last 20 years, just like India's been doing for the last 20 years, because you want to keep your people warm, because you want to keep the cost of groceries down, then you've got to take a good, hard look at energy reality. And this is where I see a lot of you First Nations talking about your dreams of energy, about forestry. The world needs energy now more than ever. BC needs manufacturing for the economy more than ever. We have become so dependent for manufacturing that if the supply chain shuts down in Alberta, the United States, China, we feel it directly. When the Coca-Cola Highway got washed out, they limited gas rations to 30 liters per person per fill up. That is called dependence. There's a refinery right now, it's in, on fire in California right now. When that settles out, there'll be less energy. There'll be less gas and diesel for the market. It's gonna affect us. And as Germany and Europe buy up all energy sources around the world, that's gonna affect us. Canada needs what you guys are talking about right now. If you do want to help out Canada, you want to help out the province, you want to help out the region, you want to help out your community, you got to step up your game. You got to understand where this all flows from. From your back door to Victoria to Ottawa, it's politics. I have not seen one piece of legislation in regards to energy or resource development right now in Victoria that makes any sense because it's politics. And I don't care what party you're part of. I really don't care. I, because I thought Victoria and Ottawa are basing their decisions on what's best for the citizens of British Columbia and Cana Canadians. That's what I thought. Very naive. I'm still on the learning curve. And now I'm starting to realize, no, this is pure ideology. It doesn't matter to the political parties whether or not your cost of butter has gone up two bucks. It doesn't matter. The pain at the pump that you're feeling, whether you're talking about the fuel for your boat, your gill netter, your outboard, your truck, it does not matter. That's what I've learned. So if you want to learn more about this, do some reading. And then if you understand the politics, try to read between the lines in terms of what government's telling you and what you're reading in the paper, and you'll find you can trace that back to politics. Uh, I actually know Business Council of BC very well. Uh, when I was the temporary chief council of Heiser Nation, Greg Davignon for the Business Council of BC was actually on a tour of BC. And they were trying to show lower mainland people the reality of resource development and First Nations issues through a tour. So during lunch hour uh, break, we brought them in. We had no idea who these people were, but they became allies of First Nations. They'd written a lot of papers on First Nations business. They've written a lot of papers on the economy of BC. They're strong advocates. They're one of the, they are the lar largest advocates lobbying organization in BC right now. Government in the past used to listen to them. I'm not sure, quite sure they, they do today. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. The First Nations Major Project Coalition is a national collective of elective councils, hereditary chiefs, tribal councils, and developer corporations who have made the decision to come together and to advance shared interests, participating and gaining equity in positions of major projects taking place in their territories. In this final segment of Open Connection, Teresa Tate Day. My name is Teresa Tate Day. I am a co-founding member of the First Nations Major Projects Coalition. Began in 2014 when we saw that uh, with our Pacific Trails pipeline that we could make six billion dollars on an equities, having an equity stake in that project. And back then we could not get a loan guarantee and uh, organized ourselves to uh, 
Well, I've worked with indigenous people now we have a uh, hundred indigenous people of ten cross United um, uh, as members of the associations later blood expulsion. Um so back then we bring the threes working together, together we are stronger. And um that's one hat that I wear. And from that first meeting in twenty fourteen, we as hereditary chiefs that we came to the table. I am a Wet'suwet'en member and I am a hereditary to chief from the Wet'suwet'en. And many of us, uh, when we heard this uh, idea of having an equity state in this project, uh, we realized that um, we've never had the ability as First Nations to have equity state in any kind of project. Since the Delcom of the State Wings decision, the Supreme Court decision, that was um, recognized um, our Aboriginal rights to accommodate and consult. Uh, we've only received the very minimal uh, impact benefit agreements and in the suit and really nothing. Um, I have worn kind of two hats here as a hereditary speaking. Um, many of us women thought that the way to go was to for, organize ourselves so that we can uh, influence our nation members to get an equity stake in any project that came down the pike. Anyway, as a result of that, there was a lot of fallout, and I would really appreciate uh, Chris's comments on the uh, how the um, yeah. the NGOs, the non-government uh, organizations, have impacted us um, because of a lack of understanding and really the history of our people as Indigenous people not being able to really sustain ourselves with any, any economics at all. It's a history that we carry forward. And we've been struggling with that history of internalized oppression, internalized dominance, internalized racism, and um, within our locations. And I'm really happy to hear and themes the work that is being done. And so I'm wondering uh, what time, um, um, as a uh, member of the Wasuotan Nation and as a Crow uh, and development, um, an industry development person, these are, there are a few of us within our nation, but we are hamstrung by the fact that we cannot organize ourselves because you're right, Chris. Uh, because we speak up for development, we are targeted as you know as a person, and um, so it really has left us in a quandary. Because uh, we, how do we move forward? And so my question, I guess, is um, how do we um, access your services and your expertise on the um, getting the information, not fighting against the design, environmental groups. Uh, just recently, there was a call out. There was one group within our nation, the Dinamian group, who have organized themselves and who are paying members to go and protest. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Open Connection. The greatest distance in the existence of man is not from here to there, but the connection from his mind and heart. If we can conquer that distance, we can soar like an eagle and realize our mercy within. I'm Robert Pectel.